Hello and welcome to Talk of the Town. The Port Adelaide Premiership Champions name is Warren Treadray. He's also made himself Taylor Adams' favourite media commentator over the past seven days. Treaders, hello. Hey, since I fired back, I've heard crickets. He's run out of, <laughs> he's run out of fuel, run out of armoury. No more bullets to find my way. No, you can check that out on Taylor Adams' account. He had a little gentle go at our discussion, a very calm discussion about the uh, players staying up in Queensland postseason, which brings us to the Chief Football Reporter for the Nine Network, Sam McClure. Hello. Hello, Seb. Hello, Warren. I'll just be steering clear of any arguments today. I'll just be keeping my head down and keeping my smile on. We're going to get on to the crows in a sec, Sam. Then you can have a chance. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the Tom Pappy situation because last year that he wanted to come to Victoria. He told Sydney he wanted to come back to Victoria. But over the weekend, it appears like he's staying in Sydney. He's told the club that. There's an Instagram story that you can see here. Yes, the red and white art suggesting he is staying. And a big part of it, apparently John Longmire's influence. So, Treaders, is this a feather in the cap of horse and the Sydney Swans to keep a player the quality of Papley? Yeah, absolutely it is. It's not the first time a player's had a U-turn to get traded. I know I did it years ago. I wanted out and then Mark Williams was put in and then you felt like you had a coach that believed in you. You know, no doubt that coach has been there at a period of time. He's talked about family issues that are no longer an issue right now and he can manage them well. He's had a mate moved up from Melbourne. So, mate, the way he's playing his footy, I wouldn't be moving anywhere because he has had a wonderful season in a team that is clearly rebuilding and struggled for consistent performance. And at the top end of a ladder, he's earmarked as an All-Australian. He has had a sensational season and that's a great commitment because you look around and go, hey, Papley's committed, why won't we? That sends a great message to the rest of the team. 24 goals and 16 matches this season. Sam, where does it leave the Blues? He was their big target. Yeah, well, I think it leaves the Blues exactly where they are. And, you know, I think if we, uh, if you can watch what happened against the bottom place team on the weekend when they were 50 points down at half time, they are far from a Tom Papley away from being a good team. There's a lot more issues there. So maybe it might help deliver some home truths at the Blues. Um, they were going to pay him a lot of money to be a small forward. Maybe they'll invest that money in the desperately needed midfield that they need to help out the likes of Paddy Cripps and Ed Kerno um, because they're not getting that supply at the moment. Um, I still think Zach Williams is at the top of their list. Whether he decides to go there or not uh, is is quite another scenario. The team he's playing for at the moment isn't flying, nor is uh, Treaders, the other team, trying to get him the Bombers. Yeah, but it's interesting. I want to ask you this question. Eddie Betts, there's a lot of speculation whether he goes on. Now that Papley doesn't want to move, um, does that mean he gets another season? Yeah, it's a really interesting one, Trent. I get the sense he's going to get another year, almost in a Sean Burgoyne role. Play, you know, six to 12 games, be a coach as well. Um, it helps out with the soft cap. He's had a really big influence on the likes of Jack Martin. So I get the sense that he will. Um, they clearly will look back and regret the fact that they didn't get Dan Butler, um, because, you know, they still are in the need of a small forward and David Cunningham hasn't turned into the player that they desperately have wanted him to do so far in his career. Um, but the Blues need mids, I think, Treaders. They need a Zach Williams. They need a Josh Kelly. They might even need a Brad Crouch. But um, just on Papley, Treaders, I was really curious to say that you said he's had a fantastic year. His start to the year was really good. He's kicked three goals in the last seven games. He's been pretty quiet in the back half. I just um, was curious that you think he might be a lock for all Australian selection. Oh, no, I don't think he's a lock for all Australian selection, but I think at the pathway mark of the year, you'd have to say, well, geez, yeah. if you pick the team at that time, you know, like Charlie Dixon was clearly the biggest, uh, he was the best small forward, Dixon was the biggest big forward. Now, obviously, uh, Hawkins has had a huge second half of the season, but oh, I look at the other small forwards in the comp, you go, yeah, Butler's been amazing, Charlie Cameron was off to a flyer early and slowed. I think it's part and parcel of the season, to be honest. I don't think the small forwards other than Butler have been really consistent. So uh, I still think he's been one of the best small forwards and he's had to do it in their team. It's pretty ordinary, let's be honest. They're clearly rebuilding in their bottom part of the ladder. So would I think pay, it's been a... Would you, pay, you pay the same amount as you pay a, a ready-made gun midfielder, Tom Papley? No. No, he's not that uh, player. Sam, I love when, uh, when Treaders uh, says, if you were picking the All-Australian team, he is picking the All-Australian team. Is. So that's uh, yeah. have him uh, on the program. Anyway, let's move on to this. I want to talk broadly about the rising star competition. And it's come up because this week... As we take a look at the player who did get the nomination, Isaac Quainor, and a player who his teammates believe should have got the nomination in Lockie Scholl. You can see 
their respective performances over the weekend. Scholl, 24 touches, two goals. Quain, or the seven disposals. But he did have a lot of metres gained. Anyway, it's brought up tweets, and we'll roll through these, from the likes of Big Tex Walker, who says here, can someone please explain to me why Lachlan Scholl missed out on something today? And Tom Doty, he says, hang on, hold up, wait a second, there's something wrong here. Correct me if I'm wrong. But that, this week's nomination, doesn't say Lachlan Scholl. And we'll start with you. We're told that the rising star picks the best young performance of the week and that's who gets the nomination. Is that really true or does it get juggled a little bit throughout the season? No, that's absolutely not how it's picked. Um, I think that anyone that sort of makes calls and speaks to people that actually select it, it's done on, on, a, on a much broader basis than that. They want to see consistency of performance and that's why you often see um, top 10 picks, Treaders, and you would know this, who have good games early in the year don't necessarily get the nominations because they know that they'll probably play another good game later in the year. So they wait for consistency. Now, Isaac Quainall was probably on some sort of whiteboard that they would have liked to get him a nomination. But you make a rod for your own back as a selector when in the last few weeks, a Lockie Scholl pulls out a great performance. In my opinion, was the best player on the ground at halftime. Would probably get Brownlow votes. Um, but they desperately wanted to try to get Quainall in there, Treaders. I, I reckon the AFL would... would um, it would be a really big fill-up for them and for the fans if they would just come out and openly admit that. I don't know why they have to hide it, but uh, it causes frustrations and good on the Crows players for you know, trying to stir the pot and stick up for them one of their own. I must admit, I was shocked uh, late last night in the newsroom when it came through and said he missed out because uh, I know you touched on before, Seb, that it was metres gained. I think metres gained were like 300 compared to uh, Shell's 620. So... Oh, I, I know, you know, as an All-Australian selector, which I am, you pick that team, but you also pick the rising star. But you have nothing to do with the nominations. You can mention and text message certain people to say, hey, did you see this game? This guy was great. But I was shocked. Now, Cronos had an unbelievable season. The reason I can tell you why, and then this is my information from what I get, I haven't made any fo- uh, phone calls in the last 24 hours, but Cronos' work over the body of work for the year would suggest that he's probably in front from the instance of the games. If it was come down to the single match, then Shell certainly gets the single match. So what you find too, though, is uh, Shell's games, he'd be eligible for next year's award. Quainer, probably not so, because he's probably played more than the threshold. I think it is 11 games. So it, it really is a tough one. That, don't you reckon, Treaders? Just come out and admit it. Like, I don't well, think anyone has a problem with it if the AFL just no. said, we want the body of work. We, we're, not, we're not picking nominations based on one guy. Well, it's clarity. I think clarity, like anything, always helps in um, in this game. And as we know, with you know, is it a sling tackle, a sling tackle? Why has someone got it? You need clarity, and then you can make your judgment off the back of clarity. But I think Charles did sit stiff because his performance was brilliant. Twenty-four he's touches, two goals, that. three clearances, eight scoring involvements. Um, but Quayne, you know, he's had a wonderful year, and he d- deservedly. Um, and the, the AFL is running out of time too. What we got? One more round of football. Yeah. We might upgrade two this week. So I would suggest that if Shaw has a pretty good game, I dare say he'll be up in lights for his four possessions this week. He might get wink, wink. <laughs> hey, yeah, Sam, just before we go on from this topic, there has been a bit of chat about how the Adelaide leaders uh, you know, haven't spoken out on some issues over, over the journey. I mean, Camp being one of them, for example. But they're very vocal here about the Rising Star nomination. What did you make of that? Um, oh, no, I think we had Rory there on radio last night. Like, they've won three in a row. They're, they're, they're up and about. And I, I like the fact that they're sticking up for, for one, of their, one of their own. You know, the Adelaide Footy Club's one of the proudest in the country. Don't try to get me back uh, going over old ground, Seth, because I will not be sucked into that. Quickly, before we get to uh, Triple S, everybody's favourite segment, I wanted to talk about Bryce Gibbs. The Crows won on the weekend. They beat the Blues. Uh, and at the end, in a scene that David King has described as weird... Kate Simpson and Mike B cheer Bryce Gibbs off the ground. The Carlton players cheering an Adelaide player off the ground. What did you make of it, Trips? I liked it. You know why? He didn't. His career at Adelaide didn't deserve to being cheered off. But realistically, or it didn't. Like he had 35 games. It hasn't worked. Come back. But clearly, this was negotiated. He's got a year on his contract that's either being paid out partly over two years or up front this year. He knew he'd get a farewell game. It just so happened to be against his former club. I love the fact that two of his close mates, and Kate Simpson would have been renowned, and they would have both known they were each retiring. Um, Because only yesterday, the last 24 hours, he announced his. I like the fact that there was a human element to it. If they were both playing for finals, no way in the world. I don't believe in farewell games when you're still in the running for the finals, but I had no problem with it, and I can't believe the hysteria that it's caused, to be honest. Very good. All right, let's move on to Seb's 
speedy segment, or as we like to call it, triple S. All right, 60 seconds on the clock, and a couple of quick fire questions. We will start the timer. And now, firstly to you, Dredders, the AFL made the right call by not staging a Gala Brownlow event. Yes. Yeah, I think it's probably reading the wind a little bit. Sam, would Joey Danaher look better in red and white or blue and white hoops? better in a club that's not red and black. See, that wasn't the question. The I that wasn't the question, Your Honour. <laughs> oh, that's right. Restart the clock. Sam, who's more likely to get Joe, the Cats or the Swans? Sydney. Yeah, that's what I feel. Treaders, Kate Simpson's duplicity and contribution over more than 341 games has not been recognised enough, true or false? Uh, that's false. He, he's been recognised. He's been recognised as a one, wonderful warrior in a tough time for the Blues. And what's he played? 340 odd? Unbelievable. All Australian cronies he hasn't been in. One All Australian. How does that happen? Well, probably hasn't had a good enough year. No, no, he has. No. In term, no, for the Blues he would have. But has he been that outstanding that he's actually beaten people or been better than people who are playing finals football? Clearly no, not. I, I, I'm actually just staring at the pot traders, but what I will say just on that one, I reckon that Simpson is is one of the the glaring examples of that you can still be a star of the game and have a wonderful career and it not be littered with uh, premierships and Brownlow medals and All Australians. One best of various, one All Australian. Um, I think that undersells Kate Simpson's value over 342 games, but it's not all about the personal accolades, traders. No, it's not. It's about the value how you're held within your footy club. I agree with that. That's more important than anything. Restart the clock. Uh, Treaders, we still have a Grand Final Entertainment Act. I've been doing some Googling. What about to Helen back the Australian meatloaf experience to re recreate that famous meatloaf performance? What are the vegans going to like? They're not going <laughs> to buy into that. <laughs> I don't, do they have vegans in Queensland? I'm not sure they do. Yeah, no, no there's nothing wrong with vegans. But mate, uh, we've had mate, meatloaf once and it was off. We're not touching it again. <laughs> Fair enough. Social Club, we better get to. Jeez, it's an all-time episode this week. Uh, just quickly take a look at this uh, heartwarming moment as Toby McLean from the Bulldogs reunites with his own canine. You ready? Hello. Who is it? Hey! Who is it? Warming moment. I think we can leave that there. To move on to our sure things, have a look at the leaderboard. Sam, Seb, one game will decide if it's an outright winner or a tie. Well, we decide, Treaders. Who's your sure thing for this weekend? Uh, I'm going uh, Richmond. Richmond, yeah, over Adelaide. That's okay, yep. you've stolen mine. Uh, Sam, have you got one? I think that Brisbane will beat Carlton. That's where I was going for number two. Okay, which leaves me with where I was going to start. And that is, if I'm going to win this, I'm going to win it off the back of the Bombers. Melbourne to screw up their finals attempt thanks to an Essendon victory this weekend. Don't let me down. Hey, would, you, would you like to just give us a, a sentence or a paragraph on what it's been like being an Essendon supporter this year, Seb? Uh, well, there's a... Um, there's a, there's a poem called Dante's Inferno <laughs> about a man who gets sent to hell. Um, anyway, uh, we, we'll, we'll leave it at we'll that. Escalated. That escalated. <laughs> uh, Warren Treadrow, Port Adelaide Premiership Champion, thanks for your, your time. No worries, and hopefully uh, next week Sam can do up that button that's showing a lot of chest hair. Oh, wow, yeah. Okay. Goodness gracious. Uh, Sam McClure is the... Chief Football Reporter for the Nine Network. Thank you. Thank you, Seb. And I just give the people what they want. <laughs> <laughs> this is talking about.